into an atmosphere of prayer to God. Would you lift up your voice right now and begin to bless the name of the Lord? We bless the name of the Lord at all times. Let his praise be continually be in my mouth. We bless your name, Father. We adore you. We honor you, God. We worship you, Father. We thank you for your presence. Come on, somebody. Help me. weekend, uh, different events across the state, and um, October is a very significant time in the spirit realm, not to be spooky, but you can look it up on the website, uh, whether it's the Church of Satan or, or paganism, October is a month where there are specific prayer requests, if you will, this is well documented in the dark spiritual world, and one of the main prayer requests they pray against is against uh, families, against fathers, against churches, and um, I, I spent some time studying over the last few years, and, and it's a month where there's a lot of spiritual activity against the church, against what we're doing here tonight, and there's an agenda and a, and a thought out in the world that this next generation doesn't want anything to do with God, but I'm so happy to be in the house of the Lord with some people that say, hey, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. How many know no weapon formed against us shall prosper? The best days of the church are ahead of us. Come on, do you believe that? I believe that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. And I feel this in my spirit tonight is going to be a spiritually significant night in the lives of many in this room. And as much effort as there has been for some of you not to even make it tonight, I feel that for somebody in this room. There was a a strategic attempt by the enemy for you not to be here tonight. And the Lord has allowed you to be here. And I don't care if there was two people here or 2,000 people here. I don't believe in coincidence. And I believe that it is the providence of God that's brought us in this house tonight. Come on, would you thank God in advance for what he's going to do? Come on, would you do it in advance for what he's going to do? If you could, open your Bibles to 2 Timothy. Uh, 1 Timothy, I'm sorry, chapter 1, 1 Timothy chapter 1. I do want to give honor. Um, I'm so thankful to be here. Um, Brother Dustin Williams called me last year to be here, and I felt such an anticipation as soon as he did. Um, but I'm so thankful for the new leadership uh, that's been put in place, and uh, it's been fantastic to be around uh, these great men and women of God already this week. Don't you love uh, Brother DeLong? Don't you love Brother Hinkle? Don't you love your leadership? And, uh, and Brother Cressman, I don't know Brother Cressman very well, but uh, I got to hear, I, I had to leave, I got to have lunch with my pastor today. He lives in this area. Uh, but I got to hear some of the vision uh, for this district hyphen, and it was clear. Uh, and it was powerful, and uh, I'm so excited uh, for what God is going to do in the future of this district. I don't know how long you've been in this position, but I felt such a, a prophetic agreement with what you were saying today. And I'm just excited about what God's doing. Aren't you thankful for the Crestman family and the leadership? Come on, would you give them a hand just a little bit louder? And, of course, uh, Brother Buford. Uh, is here today. I got to meet him, and we honor you, sir. Thank you for opening up your church to us. Would you give Brother Buford a hand? And that's a, hey, what a fantastic church and ministry team. Uh, I don't know who this worship leader is, but my God Almighty, uh, he was amazing. And uh, as he started singing, and I looked, I said, who is that? And um, I, I, I would just love being here so far. Second Timothy, or sorry, First Timothy chapter 4, I'll digress. It says, let no one despise your youth. Let no one despise your youth. But be an example to the believers in word, 
and conduct and love and spirit and faith and purity. I love this because Paul lays out a pathway for a young person to have influence in their season. If you're a young person in this room, there is a pathway for you to have influence before you're 50 or 60 or 45 years old. I'm believing the future of the church is now. Amen, everybody? But I want you to look at that. It says, be an example to the believers in word. I love that this emphasis on the word of God in this this hyphen group. In conduct, how you carry yourself. In love, in, in the spirit, in faith, in purity. Until I come, give attention to the reading, to the exhortation, to the doctrine. And do not neglect, key verse here, the gift that is in you, which was given to you by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the eldership. Paul encourages the young leader here and says, don't forget that there's some things that were placed inside of you. And they were placed inside of you by the hand of prophecy. He goes on in 2 Timothy to say, don't, he said, stir up the gift that's within you that was given to you by the laying on of my hands. I want to talk to you about this placement that can happen in the life of a believer, in the life of a young adult, that the prophetic atmosphere can place something inside of you that can make a difference. I want to preach to you about prophecy tonight. And my sermon title is The Placement of Prophecy. And I'm believing that God is going to meet us in a tremendous way. Would you lift your hands towards heaven? This, I, I feel this in my spirit. The Bible says, hear me, hear me, hear me. The Bible says that Jesus could do no great miracle in his hometown because there was no honor there. Whatever you honor, you will receive from. Prophecy, the gift of prophecy, the working of miracles, the, the gift of faith, I believe is going to be an operation in this service. But we've got to honor it if we're going to receive from it. Would you honor Jesus right now? Come on, would you lift up your hands and honor Jesus right now and tell him, God, I receive everything that you have for me. I'm believing in faith, God, that you are, you said where two or three were gathered in your name, you would be in the midst and we claim in Jesus' name that you are in the midst today, able and willing to do what you said you would do. And would you help me and clap your hands towards heaven? Come on, would you clap your hands towards heaven? All right. High five your neighbor, and you may be seated. I'm glad to be here with my new friend, Brother Amani, who got in here from Canada, and he's going to be ministering to us tomorrow. Would you give him a hand? I'm so excited to hear from him. Prophecy is often the currency of transition. Prophecy is often the currency of transition. When God shows up and he's going to shift an atmosphere, he's going to shift a life, a church, he's going to shift a person, often the spirit of prophecy will begin to show up in that person or in that place or in that atmosphere. Many of us have plans and agendas and things that we uh, like to accomplish and do and strategies to, to do things even for the Lord or do things in our life and in our future. And often when we look at growth or we look at the next level uh, on YouTube, there's this whole culture of, of, you know, rise and grind culture and you got to be about your business. And, and, and you would say in the YouTube culture that, that work ethic is the currency of growth. Or, or maybe in the church world we say that excellence is, the, is kind of the currency of growth. And I love uh, churches like this that are done with excellence. And, and I believe that everything should be done in decency and in order. Amen, everybody. And, and there's all these narratives that there's different principles, if you will, that are the currency for growth and, and forward momentum in a life of a person or even in the church and the life of a believer. But I often find and have seen anecdotally that when God shows up to move something, to shift something in his plans and his way, the currency that shows up is not just excellence or, or working hard or it's not just a, a, a more effort, but often prophecy is the principle that begins to show up when God wants to do something new in a place or a person. There's a difference, ladies and gentlemen, between a good plan and a God plan. There's a difference between a good strategy and a God plan strategy. The Bible says many are the plans of a man, but but it's God that establishes his path. And I just feel this in the Holy Ghost on this uh, Friday night. It's Friday the 13th, and we're going to give the devil a black eye. Come on, somebody. Amen. But I just feel this in my spirit that there's some people in this room that have had a good plan, a good strategy. 
You, you've worked to have some excellence, some work ethic. You, you've worked to get yourself together. You know how to dress. You, you got the right jacket. You got the right haircut. You know how to do it. And, and you're trying to move some things forward in your life and, and maybe relationships. You, you're trying to position yourself and place yourself in the right place at the right time around the right people to get the next level of progress that you want. And I just feel this in my spirit today. I feel like God has shown up even at this hyphen conference and I love, I think he loves some of your plans, but I just wanted to say this. I feel like God wants to mess up some of our plans in the name of Jesus. Yeah. Hey, I believe that God does have a plan for your life. I feel this. There's some people in this room that, that are young adults that feel aimless and directionless. And you don't know how you're going to get from point A to point B to point Z. And, and you've been told and you've been prophesied to. Because prophecy is not just something that is used in the supernatural or the positive. Prophecy is something that simply creates a faith in somebody's heart. As we're going to talk about in a second. But some of you have received negative prophecies. And words that have been spoken over you that you're gonna not going to... Uh, amount to anything and, and you've had parents tell you well well you're just going to end up in jail or you've had people say things to you that that you're not going to be anything you're not going to accomplish anything but I've come to say at the outset of my message that God has a plan for your life I've come to prophesy and let somebody know that every word that's been spoken over you to try to quench the plan that God has for your life I rebuke it in the name of Jesus and we claim that you are blessed and highly faithful favor and the spirit of God is upon you to do good works for him. Jeremiah 29 11 says I know the plans I have for you saith God they're for good and not evil to give you an expected in a future and a hope and I feel this there's a promise that's on somebody's life in this room that you've had negative words spoken over you to make you doubt that there's any significant future and there's a settling that would like to come into your heart to just say Settle for mediocrity and settle just to be comfortable and to have a decent life. But I've come to say that it's not the will of God for you just to have a decent life. You've got a destiny. You've got a calling. You've got a capacity in the kingdom that's greater than any word that's ever been spoken. And I just feel this in my spirit. Let God be true and every man a liar. That lie from Satan that says that you can't be great, we rebuke it in Jesus' name and we claim Come on, somebody, that we are favored and blessed by God, and he's going to do something great in your life. If you believe that, would you receive that with a hand clap of praise and let God know, I believe I'm called. I believe I'm chosen. I believe there's a future and a hope on my life. But there's this mediocre ministry. There's this mediocre spirit. That would like to come and, and steal, but I've come to say that what God has planned for you is bigger than anything you've ever seen. It's bigger. It's bigger. It's bigger. The Bible says that the latter should be greater than the former. One of the, one of the blessings of having a, a district like this where you've got so many great churches. And, I mean, Brother Parkey today, don't you love your superintendent? He about put me, listen, he about put me under the floor. Come on, somebody. I love one of the blessings that y'all have is you're constantly inundated with, with some of the best minds and some of the, the best spiritual giants. You, you got Urshan College within range of you and, and, and the, some of the best apostolic leaders in the world are there. And, and some of you live in this area. And, and, and the, 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 I, was, I had Adam Hunley, the, our new uh, uh, foreign missions director, was with us a couple months ago at my church. I was so honored, and it was such a big deal for our church. And some of you go to church with him every week. You look across the room, and that, there, there, there goes, you know, there goes, brother. Brother Cressman, you know, there, there goes, brother, so-and-so. And, and it's amazing. And I'm so thankful for you, but one of the, the, the blessings, Brother Parkey said it today, sometimes a blessing can be a curse. Because the bottom line is, is what happens in an atmosphere like this is you see some of these giants in the faith, and it's so up there, and it's so high that, oh, that's just great, and, and, and that's just amazing, and, and that's something to look up to. But can I just tell you that the Bible says that the latter should be greater than the former. We honor all of our elders. We thank God for all the people that have paved the way for what God's doing in the kingdom now. But the ones that are really great, they don't want us just looking up to them. They want us to get on their shoes. 
shoulders and go to another place. Can I just say it into the atmosphere of this church and this and this service and these young adults? Can I just say it? The greatest churches have yet to be planted. Come on, the greatest ministers are just getting started. Come on, the greatest evangelists may be in this room. The greatest missionaries and church planters and leaders are not out there in headquarters. They're coming up in the next generation because the latter should be greater than the former and God is just getting started. But don't you settle for decent when God's got a destiny for your life. Don't you settle to be comfortable to receive from the blessings of the people that have come before us. There is a call and a mission on our life to take what we've been given and take it to the next place we're supposed to occupy until he comes. And if he's not come back yet, then he's not finished. And I've come to tell you, if he's not finished, then there's a future for the church that's greater than we've ever seen. greater, it's greater, it's greater. When's the last time you believe God for the impossible? I was standing at, because of the times in 2017, I was 26 years old. And I was standing in a, in a powerful apostolic atmosphere down in uh, Louisiana. And Brother Anthony Mangan stood up and he began to prophesy. He began to speak. He began to, to claim and, and, and declare over the next generation. He said, there's young men this room that God's about to give old mantles. And he said, if you want to receive from God, lift up your hands and receive it. And I just had enough faith in my spirit that the man of God had prophesied over this room. There were thousands of people there. But I just said, that prophecy is for me. And I lifted up my hands, and as soon as I did, I felt this impression. That was like a brick sat on my chest. And the Lord told me, start a church in Royal Oak. I didn't even know exactly where Royal Oak was at the time. I was 26 years old and didn't think that I had any any kind of plans to plant a church. I never thought about it. It never entered my mind. It it was never something I was intending to do or planning to do. But but the Lord began to speak to me about planting this church in in the city of Royal Oak. And I went back to my pastor and and I was hoping he would talk me out of it because all those church planting stories, like was said, were just sounded terrible to me. I didn't want to do anything like that. It sounded like a really uh, cruel and unusual punishment. Come on, somebody, right? And, and I went back to my pastor, and my pastor looked back at me, and he said, Jamil, he said, that, that city you're talking about, Royal Oak, and, and tears began to flow down his eyes. He said, what you don't know about that, son, is that Royal Oak was, was the, the city that had the strongest church in this whole entire region in the, in the 1950s. Our first superintendent in Michigan, C.C. Kirby, pastored a church in Royal Oak. And, and, and he took me down to the, to the, the city, the, to the area where, where that church still stands to this day. They sold to the Salvation Army. And, and, and 400 people that were going to that church in 1955, began, they closed down the church, he gave it to his son, and the church just kind of dissipated, and, and the assistant pastor of that church was N.A. Urshan. And N.A. Urshan, before he went to Indianapolis, was the assistant pastor of the church. And it's an amazing church. And he told me, son, what you don't know is that this was one of our strongest churches. And, and, and after N.A. Urshan left, there, there was this remnant and, and some things happened. And, and, and the, the new pastor that took over failed. And that church failed to exist. And there hasn't been an apostolic presence back in Royal Oak in years. And, and he said, I, I, son, I, I just feel like God's called you to do this. And, and little did I know that that as we began to announce that God, what we were planning to do in that city, we started getting calls from people all over the country that were in their 80s and 90s. One man with a last name born was 97 years old. And when he heard we were going to start a church in Royal Oak, he called me and he said, son, I've been praying. He said, I grew up in that church and I helped build that church with my bare hands. And he said, son, I've been praying and prophesying every day for 60 years for God to put somebody back in that that city won't you go and take it for the kingdom of God what am I saying is that there's a 
There was a prophecy over that ground. There was a prophecy that came over my heart that matched with a prophecy that was over that city. And God placed us in that city to do a work for God on the heels of a prophetic atmosphere. What city in Missouri has been being prophesied over that doesn't have a church planner yet? What ministry has your pastor been prophesying and speaking over that he hasn't seen come to fruition yet? I've come to tell a young adult in Missouri that it's time for somebody to let the spirit of prophecy come over you and place in you a vision and a dream and a gift to accomplish something great for God. Will somebody lift your hands right now and say, speak, Lord, your servant's listening. God, if it's your will for me to do something greater than what I've said, God, let me, let me step in it, God. Let me walk in it. Let me have faith. We went forward to plant the church. and Yeah. We went forward to plant the church, and I didn't feel worthy or able or capable. 26 years old, had no experience, didn't know anything about church planning. I came here to St. Louis for an event called Launch and, and got some training. But, but most of all, I was crippled with insecurity and fear and doubt that how could a young man like me with a, with a young wife and a young family, how could we do this? And, and some of the dreams that God put in my heart were so audacious that I, I never really seen it done that way before. And, and I was reminded for some of you that God has given you a vision. God has given you something that you believe in God for. And you keep disqualifying yourself on the grounds of, well, I'm not righteous enough, or I'm not worthy enough, or I'm not qualified enough. You've heard it said a thousand times, God is not calling the qualified. He qualifies the call. Many are called, but few are chosen. And what that means is few pick up the phone. Do you know the Bible says that the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few? Jesus Christ has a labor problem. He's got more work to be done than people willing to do it. So I'm just telling you this whole narrative that well, I'm disqualified. I'm just telling you, you go to any of these restaurants around here these days that, that have more work than they can find workers. Guess what? Their qualifications aren't crazy high if you can't tell. The, the, the service at Chick-fil-A ain't like it used to be. But the reality is not that I'm saying God has some kind of lower standard. He, he calls us up to a higher standard. But he's not waiting for us to get perfect, to be in a purpose. He's waiting us for us to say yes to the call, and he'll develop our character. Can I just tell somebody who's waiting to get perfect before you say yes to the call of God? Why don't you say yes and get a vision? Because the Bible says that without vision, the people perish. They cast off restraint. In other words, discipline follows vision. When you get a vision, you'll get the requisite motivation to discipline yourself, to follow after. Do you know, I, I don't know what my spiritual life, you, we got some pastors in there. I don't, I'm not sure if I'd be quite as studying the Bible if I didn't have to preach every week. I'm just going to be honest with you. I think, I'd, I think I'd still be living for God. But the reality is the vision that God's called me to is part of the motivation every morning when I get up to seek the face of God. I'm not just doing it for me, but I'm thinking about those children that are sleeping in the next room that I'm responsible for, and that's my, I'm thinking about that church that's showing up every Sunday needing to hear a word from God. I'm thinking about that single mother who's showing up after going the whole week trying to somehow get her kids out of the grips of a hell and into church, and when I wake up in the morning, I got a vision that I got to get up and seek the face of God because somebody needs to get a word from God. Can I tell somebody, stop waiting to be more disciplined and why don't you ask God for a vision and the vision will give you a greater strength to have the discipline if you'll say yes to God. It's God, Paul said, that works in us both to will and to do for his good pleasure. It's God that will give you the desire. I don't know why I got a stick on it. Was, it's God that will give you the desire to do the right thing. 
He'll give you the desire to, the Bible says that, that God will give us the desires of our hearts. Brother Buford, I don't believe that means he'll give us what, what we want. I believe that often means he'll give us what to want. And if we'll say yes to God and say, God, I, 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 I'm saying yes to you, I promise you, God will begin to give you a different will, a different desire, a different motivation, something that wakes up in the morning and says, i got to do something for him. But he cannot do that until you say yes to the call. Can I just tell somebody, God's got a plan for your life. God's got a future and a hope for you. And it's time to say yes. To the calling, and I promise God will develop your character. The Bible says in Genesis 15 that there was a promise over Abraham's life. And the Bible says that Abraham had a hard time believing the promise that God had given. It seemed so unrealistic. He had promised Abraham that he was going to have this seed that was going to be multiplied like the stars in heaven. And, and at this moment, Dave, or Abraham had no evidence that what God had said would ever come true. But yet in this moment in Genesis 15, the Bible says that Abraham finally gets over some of that doubt. And he believes God. And the Bible says Abraham believes believed God and it was counted unto him as righteousness. I feel a word in my spirit for somebody right now that you are waiting to be righteous to have revival in your church. I'm telling you, if you'll believe that God can do it, you'll be counted unto you as righteousness. And that word means, check this out, it means it's credited unto him. It's a mathematical term. That the account of righteousness and godliness that he didn't deserve was credited unto him on the grounds of him believing and having faith in the word of God. Can I tell somebody in this room, I don't know why I've got to stick here for just a moment, but you've got all your mathematical equations. There's somebody analytical in this room. And you're trying to add it all up and figure it all out how you can get X, Y, and Z and A, B, and C and 1, 2, and 3 to get to where God's called you to be. And God's not calling you to add up all the math. He's calling you to have a mustard seed of faith. Because if you'll have some faith at the word of God, if you believe that prophetic word, if you believe what the Bible says is true, if you believe it, the Bible says that the righteousness of God could be credited unto us. The Bible says, in the New Testament that he that had no sin became sin so that we could become the righteousness of God. Can I tell you that on your best day, our righteousness is like filthy rags. On my best day, I don't deserve to be used by God. On my best day, I don't deserve to have any anointing on my life. So stop waiting to be perfect and righteous before you say yes to God because even if you were doing better with whatever you're dealing with, it's still a filthy rag and you're nothing but by the grace of God and you're nothing but by the mercies of God so why don't you just say yes anyway can somebody clap your hands right now as an agreement to the Lord <laughs> prophecy creates an atmosphere of belief in the heart of a believer Paul said to Timothy hey listen don't despise your youth don't tell me you're too young to do something great for God. I'm living it right now. I literally, uh, <laughs> I saw our little, I saw our church with, with young adults in the room praying, and we had a lot of support from a, a neighboring church, and it was great. But I saw our church start with a little nothing, and I put this audacious dream out there that we were going to launch with hundreds of people so that by the time all the extra people went away, we could land with a nice core. And I would speak it to our little group of young adults all in our 20s. We had covering. We had an elder in our life that was overseeing us, but our church plant was just a whole bunch of kids in our 20s, and can I tell you, on the very first day when we launched, there was 367 people that showed up, and we've seen hundreds of people come in the doors of our church. I'm not... I don't say that. I was even trepidatious to say that. And my church is not 500 people. I got, I got, I, my, I landed at about a fourth of that. But the reality is, is that I was believing and receiving a word God put in my heart, in my community, in my context, that with social media and all the things we could do, that we could see a church start at that capacity. And by the grace of God, a group of 20-something-year-olds did it for his glory. And on Sunday, I'm 
I'm going to fly back this weekend, and we're going to do our missions, our missions conference this weekend. Can I tell you that little group of 20-year-olds in the last four years have given over $100,000 back into the kingdom of God? I don't say that to brag. I don't say that to say anything. I'm talking about one church of 20-year-olds have given $100,000 to the mission, the missions of the kingdom. Why am I saying that? Because it's bigger than anything you can believe. It's bigger. It's better. That God has a future and a hope for your life. And if you'll receive the prophetic word, even from scripture that says the latter could be greater than the former, I promise we're going to see the greatest churches. I'm going to say it again. The greatest churches that have ever been raised up in the apostolic movement have not been started yet. I'm going to say it again. The most effective evangelists are just coming up right now. Can I, I say it again? Hey, the greatest, greatest leaders and, and the greatest superintendents and the greatest pa- Hey, Hey, I love, I love it, Brother Parkey. I think he, he was an evangelist and became a superintendent. I'm telling you, the mold's being shifted. God's doing a new thing. I'm telling you that I just came to say that it's bigger than you think it is. And if you believe that with me, would you clap your hands one more time and say amen? All right, I got to go, I got to go, I got to go. I got seven minutes. Prophecy creates an atmosphere in the life of a believer. Paul said, hey, Timothy, don't neglect the gift that's in you that was given to you by prophecy. Hey, don't neglect that there's something in you. And how was it placed there? It was, it was given to you in a prophetic atmosphere. Can I just say this? What's in you was given to you. And, and I said it just a moment ago about the negative words, but some of you are walking around with insecurities and fears that were never meant to be what God had for your life, but it was put in you by somebody who was speaking from an insecure place themselves. That's why, by the way, I, I, I just rebuke this culture. You know, what, you know what spirit I rebuke right now in Jesus' name? It's the spirit of sarcasm. Because in the world we're living in now, if I have somebody I'm talking to at church and I tear them down and I make fun of them and, oh, why are you wearing that? And, oh, that's all funny and it's all games. But if I were to look at somebody in the eyes and say, hey, I just want you to know, brother, sister in the Lord, I just think you're amazing. God's doing something great in your life. You know, matter of fact, you stand up real quick. I'm going to make this real awkward. I'm going to make this real awkward. Hey, man. What's your name? Zane. Zane, man. I, first of all, that jacket looks great. Man, I see the passion in which you're, you're trying to play the bass with, and I just want you to know that that passion, that you're, you're using that, it's not just a passion for music, but God's given you a gift in your life to help create atmospheres of faith. God's given you a, a gift to galvanize atmospheres and make people feel more passionate about the things of God. God's given you a Barnabas gift to be able to take a Paul and speak life into them and encourage them and build them up. And one of the reasons you get so excited is because the passion God's put in you is supposed to spread from you, outside of you, and touch the lives of people around you. I believe that for you. Anybody believe that for him? But here's the thing. Here's the thing. If I were to walk up and say, Psh, man, that jacket, whoa, that'd be normal. What I just did, if we just went to church together on a Sunday, that'd be kind of awkward. Like, man, that's kind of intense. Like, dude, whoa, like, spirit of encouragement, like, all right, you know, ooh. Thank you. Can you give it up for our guy? Here's the problem. Is that in the language, in the culture of our tongues, even in the church, we've got this culture where it's more normal for us to tear each other down than it is to build each other up. It's more normal for us to, 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 to joke and jab, and I'm all about that, than it is for us to look each other in the eye and build each other up. You know what the Bible says in Hebrews 10? Don't forsake the assemblies of the believers. You come together. Why? To encourage one another, to stir each other up in love. Can I tell you, we need more of a prophetic atmosphere in the young adults in our church. We need some people that place, man, I feel this in my spirit. We need some people that can stand up and look each other in the eyes and encourage each other. And in a world that's so negative, in a world that tears each other down, you know where courage comes from? It's being in courage. And I just feel this in my spirit. Don't you forget that life and death's in the power of the tongue, that there's power in what you say, that there's something being placed in somebody every time you open up your mouth. And I just feel this in my spirit to tell somebody, it's time for us to shift our language and say, when I open up my mouth, come on somebody, I'm going to speak the blessing and the favor of the Lord. When I open up my 
my mouth. I'm not going to make it awkward to lift my brother up to encourage them in the Lord. I'm not going to make it weird in the culture of our young adult group to say, man, that was the greatest solo I've ever seen. Man, I, I, I didn't get that opportunity, but I'm glad you did. I, I don't have that money you have, but I'm so blessed and so happy you did. We need a spirit of prophecy to come inside of us because why? What's in you was given to you, and we've got a responsibility to give people prophetic words of encouragement and faith and uplifting. Paul said there's something in you that's needed for the work outside of you, and it was placed there by a word of prophecy. Let it be said of Missouri young adults that we've got a climate and an atmosphere of prophetic ministry that we speak life and faith and favor over each other. And anybody, man, I'm here. I'm here. And anybody who God's raising up in this hour, I'm going to tell you this, and y'all might not believe it right now. God's about to raise up some young adults in this district to do some things y'all haven't seen before. I'm telling you, you hear me in the Holy Ghost. God is about to raise up some young adults. They're going to plant some churches and do some things that have never been seen before. There, there's, Brother DeLong's not the last young pastor who's going to be placed in an established church earlier than people said that it, was, it should be. And I don't know if people said that. I'm just saying it's not very normal for somebody his age to have that type of opportunity. I'm telling you, that's about to happen all over this district where there's young 27-year-olds that God raises up to do something great for God. And you hear me in the Holy Ghost. I'm telling you that there's some people that I said at the beginning of my message, Jesus could do no great miracle in his hometown because there was no honor there. They tried to pull him down rather than push him up. Hey, what's going to happen if one of the kids in your, your young adult group, God puts a prophetic anointing on his life to be a powerful evangelist and preach the gospel like you've never heard before? What's going to happen when you used to see them do the dumb stuff on the weekends, but then God gets a hold of their spirit, and all of a sudden they're not hanging out on Friday nights doing that crazy stuff, and they're living for God? Are you going to be the one that says, oh, Come on, why don't you go and do something for the kingdom? Are you going to tear them down and try to jaw them back into who they used to be and disqualify what God's doing in their future because you saw what was happening in their past? I'm telling you, you mark my words. There's some young adults that you're going to see. There's some people in, the, in this room that God's about to raise up to do something great for him. And it's unprecedented and it's, it's going to be uncomfortable. And we, no, 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 you're, you're too young for that. And let no man despise thy youth. And we got to be submitted. And we got to have Bishop. I had lunch with my pastor today, and I asked him to hit me right between the eyes with some truth. I'm not saying people aren't going to have a pastor, have no oversight, but I am telling you that God is doing a new thing in Missouri. And we got to have a spirit of honor and a spirit of prophecy and a spirit that says, hey, won't you go ahead and let God make you what he's trying to make you? Won't you go ahead and let God turn you into what he's trying to turn you into? I may not get through it, but there's three things that God told me to tell you about prophecy. Number one, quickly, is prophecy proclaims Christ. Revelation 19 and 10 says the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. That prophecy is not about being spooky or, or chanting or some weird thing. Prophecy is not some weird fringe thing in the church. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. The, the prophecy is simply this. It's saying what God says, not what you see. The prophecy is, is what that song we sang yesterday, shout Jesus on the mountains, Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Prophecy is simply seeing the darkness in the world or in your family or seeing the darkness. Some of you, I felt this in prayer as I was preparing tonight. There's somebody in this room that's so crippled by loneliness in this season that there's a dark cloud hanging over your room, over your home. You're so lonely and you have you've, you've begin to think that you're forsaken not understanding that God's trying to build something in your future and that like I said yesterday prophets are built in caves and this dark season is not because God's forgotten you but this dark season is because God's trying to build you 
But prophecy is simply looking at these seasons and these dark moments and and looking at what's happening in Israel and looking at what's happening in the world. And instead of saying what God, what we see, and we begin to proclaim who Jesus is. Can I tell you, I don't care what Hamas does. Jesus is still wonderful. I don't care what's happening in the liberal agenda in this world. Jesus can still counsel. He's still the mighty God. He's still the Prince of Peace. He's still the everlasting. Father, And the Bible tells us that as the world wax worse and worse, that the grace is going to abound more and more. That the Bible says that the light in, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Same as in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. The Bible says in Him was light, and the light was the light, the, the, it was the life of men. And the light shined in the darkness. And the darkness comprehended it not. Can I tell you that there's an agenda that's trying to let it's let us know as young adults in this hour that the world's getting so dark that we might as well just settle for having church as usual. But the Bible says that the light is going to shine in darkness and it's going to be incomprehensible. Can I just say this to somebody in this room? There's a light that's about to shine through you prophetically that the darkness at your workplace, people aren't gonna, even going to know what happening. They're not going to know why there's such a shift at your workplace. They're not going to know why it used to be so oppressive and depressive when they showed up at work and now they leave with something feeling encouraged in their spirit. Why? Because I can shine in a dark place and darkness won't comprehend it. I feel in my spirit so strong to tell somebody the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy and the reason we need a prophetic spirit in this hour is because it's how we testify and magnify the name of the Lord. Come on, would you clap your hands? Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name forever. Come play for me. Come play for me. I'm almost done. Number one, that, that, that prophecy is, is how we proclaim Christ. Number two, prophecy is a promise. Look at your neighbor and say, it's a promise. Prophecy is a promise. I, I don't have time to go here too much, but Numbers chapter 11, the Bible says that in Numbers chapter 11, Moses, that was the Old Testament, he was the Old Testament archetype of prophetic ministry. And the Bible says in Numbers chapter 11 that, that Moses got overwhelmed. Please hear me in the Holy Ghost. Moses got overwhelmed by the burden of his responsibilities. Moses began to grow up in his responsibility in the Lord, and it was overwhelming. I know how it feels. I got, I got four kids. I got a growing church. I, I'm traveling. I'm doing all this. And there's times in my life and in your life, whatever you got going on, where things get overwhelming. And the world wants us to think that the promise over our life is that we're always going to be overwhelmed. And we're always going to be anxious. And we're always going to be drowning. And we're always going to be stuck like this. But the Bible says in Numbers chapter 11 that Moses looked at God and began to pray and said, God, why have you afflicted me with all this weight. God, my pastor's asking me to do this, and, and I got this ministry responsibility, and I got this job, and I'm trying to date somebody, and I'm trying to do this and that. God, it's too much, Moses said. And God says, I'm going to give the people around you, call some elders together, and I'm going to put the spirit that's on you on them. And the Bible said that they begin to prophesy. They begin to all prophesy. I don't know what it looked like, but they begin to prophesy. And then Eldad and Medad, two men that weren't really in the core group, begin to prophesy. The Bible says even Saul was got around some prophets and began to prophesy. But the Bible says that in verse 29, put it up for me, that Moses looked around after some people came to him and said, whoa, 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 whoa. These people shouldn't be prophesying. They're, they're too young. They're, they're too inexperienced. They can't do this. And the Bible says that Moses looked back and he looked back at them and he says, I wish that you would all prophesy. Can I come and tell somebody in the Missouri district that prophecy is not relegated to Brother Parkey or your pastor, but it is a promise to a generation that every single person under the sound of my voice has a prophetic unction on their life. Hey, I feel this in my spirit. There's some young women in this room. I've been praying for you. I feel it so strong. There's some young women in this room that there is an anointing on you to prophetically pray and move some things forward in this district and in your church and in your life and in your home. And I want you to know that 
Moses said, it's a, it, I want all of you to prophesy. Acts 2 and 17 says, this is that. That was spoken by the prophet Joel. He said, I'm going to pour out my spirit on all flesh. I feel this so strong. There's people that are going to come into this district that look different than you, that come from different backgrounds. They're going to get saved in some of these churches, and they're going to be at some of these events. And 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 they didn't grow up in church, and they didn't have the experience. And God is about to pour out his spirit. Can I say this? I feel this in my spirit. St. Louis is not forsaken. That city is called by God. And there's some people in that city right now that the rest of the world is riding off. And there's about to be a revival in St. Louis that's never been seen seen before. Hey, the whole world is looking at Kansas City right now. They got this, the celebrities that are showing up at the games, and, and the, the economy's probably doubled in the last five years, and, and, and the, the Super Bowls, and the, and the World Series. Can I tell you that God is not increasing the capacity and increasing the economy of Kansas City so they can get another Super Bowl ring, but there's more churches that are going to be raised up, and they're... There's athletes that are going to get filled with the Holy Ghost and they're going to preach in those locker rooms. They just had a football player last week to a tongue of Vilo who plays for Miami. I don't, he doesn't believe everything we believe, but in a press conference, they didn't push it out on the main news networks, but in a press conference, they asked him about what he's doing. He said, sometimes I'm on the sideline, and I'm not over there. You think I'm chanting. But he looked straight in the camera and said, I'm not chanting. I'm speaking in tongues. Is it too crazy to believe that Patrick Mahomes or, or, or some, some athlete that's in this area or some person that lives next to you that you could never imagine could get filled with the Holy Ghost and stand, stand in front of a camera and begin to preach the gospel to more people in one press conference than we've reached in the last year in this entire district? Can I tell you that God is about to do a new work in Missouri? He said, I'm going to pour out my spirit on all flesh. And your sons and your daughters are going to prophesy. (laughs) This is not some fringe thing for the weird kid in your youth group. This is a promise for a generation. That the sons and daughters are going to prophesy and proclaim the excellencies of Almighty God and stare in the face of Satan and all his agenda and declare that we are going to win this world, that we're going to occupy until he comes, that Jesus is still on the throne. I'm going to tell you what's about to happen. Prophecy, the last thing is prophecy opens doors. It pushes open doors. John 4, you can stand all across the room. John 4, the Bible says that Jesus comes and there was about to be a shift. The gospel was about to shift from being just just relegated to the Jewish people and it was about to break open. The message of Jesus was about to take its first foothold into the Samaritan world. The Samaritans, you know, if you know your Bible, you know they were disliked and they were disdained by all the Jewish people. It would have been so, it was ten times more impossible for a Jew to believe that a Samaritan could be saved than, than me saying that Patrick Mahomes could be saved or, or some drug dealer in your neighbor. It was inconceivable to them. And the entrance into this new world that Jesus was about to take a foothold in. The Bible says he meets that Samaritan woman at the well, and and he he looks her in the eyes and and begins to speak to her. And and, and he says in verse 14, whoever drinks of this water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman looks back and she says, sir, I'm thirsty. I, 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 need, I need something more than what I have. Give me this water that I may not thirst nor come in to draw. And Jesus says back, go call your husband. 
to come here. The woman answers and says, I have no husband. Jesus says, you have well. You, ha- you, you said it well, you have no husband. For you've had five husbands. And the one who you're with is not your husband. And the woman says back to Jesus in the initial conversation, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Jesus goes on to explain, of course, we know that he was much more than just a prophet. But the the chosen office in which Jesus was a teacher, he was a pastor, he was an apostle in his own right. All the five-fold ministry archetypes or, or traits he had exemplified. But when he was going to bring his message and his essence to a new group of people, he decided to introduce himself in the form of a prophet. Can I tell you? There's some people in the sound of my voice that your church is, is, is one, one socioeconomic group or, or maybe one culture. Maybe, maybe you, you haven't seen certain types of people reach in your community and there's something stirring up in this district. I, I, I'm telling you there's something stirring up in this district. I know it. To see some different types of people that we haven't reached at the same rate. And I knew it was the vision of Dustin Williams when he called me and, and Brother Imani and he and there, then these churches, a lot of these churches are so diverse and you're reaching different people. But there's a hunger in this district to reach into different community groups. I was sitting at the table last night and these men were sitting at the table and they were talking about these different people groups and, and and the Islams and the different people groups that there's been testimonies in this district of people being reached that were beyond the borders of what you've ever reached before. And, and I felt the Holy Ghost come over me so strong at that table. I didn't say anything. I just sat back because it's what I knew the Lord had told me to preach tonight. I'm telling you, there is a door that God is about to open up in this district. And it's going to happen by the pathway of prophecy. And there's some people out there in this com- in these communities that they're not going to hear the gospel by any other way. They're not going to hear the gospel by any other introduction. But God's about to give somebody a prophetic word, a prophetic insight, a prophetic understanding to speak past all of their preconceived notions and draw them into the kingdom of God. It was 2019, and in my church, we just went autonomous, and, 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 and I was scared to death. My church didn't know it, but but we had we had become autonomous. I was a full time pastor. We didn't have too much money in the bank. I, I was so worried. How are we going to move forward? And God, I'm only 27 years old, and, and and there's these all these people showing up every week, and and I've never done this before. God, I don't know what to do. And God connected me in my community to a, a, a business owner, one of the most well respected business owners in my whole community. And I, I met him in his store, and, and I just happened to ask him to go out to dinner one night. And I wasn't going to ask him for any money. I, that wasn't my intention. It was totally disconnected, but it just, as I reflect back, it was the same time period. And he's an Indian. He's an Indian man, him and his wife, uh, an Indian man. And, and the night before we met him and his wife for dinner, I had this dream. It was so vivid. I saw him and his wife holding a little baby boy. And, and I, I, I didn't know if they had kids. I, I never asked them that. And, and we showed up that night for dinner, and, and I looked at them after the dinner. We just had a good time. I wasn't trying to pressure them. They'd never been to our church. They'd never been to an apostolic church. They had no connection. And I said, I said y'all, well, y'all know I'm a pastor. I'm not trying to be weird, but y'all know I'm a pastor. Is there anything that uh, I could pray for you about? And hot tears began to flow down his wife's face. <laughs> She said, I'm 40, and we've been trying for 10 years to have a baby. If you just could pray. I had to work up some courage because I'd never done anything like this before. They'd never been to our church. They didn't really see me as a pastor. It was out in the wild. It was not, you know, I'm pastor so-and-so and receive a word from the Lord. We're just at a restaurant with this couple in our community. I looked back at her and I said, I don't know what to tell you, but I had a dream. And the Lord told me to tell you, you're going to have a son. 
So y'all try again. And God's going to give you a baby boy. Can I tell you that within a week of that conversation, they had their first successful attempt at pregnancy. And a year and a half later, put that picture up for me. I got to dedicate baby Silas. And there were 95 of his friends and family at our little church plant that came because they heard of the miracle. And this picture I'm showing you, before I saw it, I saw it by the spirit of prophecy. I don't know what to tell you, but there's a prophetic unction that's in this room right now. God is about to pour out visions and dreams and insight and understanding. If you need something from God, if you have something in you that's drawn you to a greater place, I want you to run to this altar and say, God, why don't you place in me what I need for the future of my calling and put it in me. Place it in me by the hands of prophecy. Come on, would you lift up your voice to heaven right now? Come on, I need a I need a lady that knows how to pray to begin to travail. Come on, I prophesy over you right now that you are a mother of Zion, that you are a woman of Zion. You may not be a mother in the natural, but you are a mother in the spirit. Why don't you go ahead and birth something right now? Begin to proclaim and prophesy over your ministry. Prophesy over your church prophesy over your husband you haven't met your husband yet but prophesy